Hey guys, it's Jerbzy, and I am finally back from what might be my longest hiatus in a while, a little bit over a month. But hey, look, on the bright side, while I was doing some adventuring in my local area, I found this sword. And it was just sitting in a stone, and I pulled it out, and it said something about some kind of ancient curse, or something like that, but you know... I doubt whatever things these say. If it's just some sketchy sword in the middle of stones, what's the worst that could happen? Hello, Shepard Gizina Thaddeus. It is I, the Dark Lord of Darkness. Since you pulled my sword from the stone, now you are cursed to cover the entire genre of RPGs. Ooh. You know what, buddy? I have a sword that I can use, so I don't know why you think you can boss me around and tell me to make an entire retrospective on a genre that will take me probably an entire year just to get through, but if you think that you're just going to be able to do that, you must have another... Oh, for the love of Pete. Fine, I'll do the darn retrospective. <laughs> So, I know what some of you are thinking. Um, Sharpzy, why are you doing this to yourself? RPGs are an absolutely massive genre, and, well, I agree with you. Why am I doing this to myself? I could literally be doing a video on anything else. I could do horror games again, which, which I absolutely love, even though I would consider RPGs to possibly be one of my favorite genres. But, you know what? I feel like for the series that I have spent two episodes creating, I wanted to go ahead and do a bigger, larger genre. And RPGs just seem like the perfect pick. Now, when it comes to RPGs, our first question is how exactly do we define it? And I feel like for this, I'm actually going to go ahead and go to my core tenets of what I think an RPG must have to be considered an RPG. Now. Defining an RPG is a little harder than you think it might be. The main reason being there are so many games that fall into the genre that I feel no strict definition of an RPG must have this, this, and this would really fit it, so instead I kind of tried to narrow it down to around five things that I think are essential. And all of these are based off the, I would say, original RPG, Dungeons & Dragons. Now we'll get a little bit more into Dungeons and Dragons in a few minutes when we actually get into the retrospective section, but for right now, just know that it's a pen and paper RPG. Pretty much all your statistics are logged on a character sheet, so yeah, it's exactly what it says on the tin, pen and paper. You're doing a lot of writing down, or in the case of more modern days, you're doing a lot of typing, so yeah, not really too much to go over there. but. Let's talk about the five characteristics that I think most RPGs have. Granted, I would say that game needs at least four of these to say definitively that it is an RPG, but if it has all five, then you can't really argue for it not being one. Number one, we have build. Now, what is build? Build is a control over a character's stats or attributes. In particular, stat distribution for the most part. Now, in a very basic sense, and why I use the term build, is it's kind of the common term they hear within RPGs, RPG communities. Whether it be a build determining what your party composition is, or a build determining what armor is equipped to what character, almost every game has some extent of build. And, well, it's kind of something that defines a lot of characters. Even in a game when you can, where you can't necessarily do something like you would in Fallout or Skyrim and go statistic by statistic, changing what characters can do, you usually have control over things like armor or other weapons. Leveling and stat growth is the next part, and that actually plays directly off of this. This has things like experience gain, or may actually link directly to stat improvement, but leveling is kind of one of those other core tenants you hear about. This could be a direct level system, for example, going 1 to 10, and other times it's done through skill trees. But basically what you need for this bare minimum is an experience system, and it needs to link to some kind of growth. This is why something like a battle pass does not technically count toward this, mainly because the further you get in something like Fortnite's battle pass, even though you might have some things that carry over from round to round, 
getting that new skin isn't exactly going to improve your character, it's just going to be something nice to have. Same thing for pretty much every other game with a battle pass. Number three is a defined combat system. Why do I say defined? Well, the combat system has to be, just as it says in the tin, a system. A whole bunch of interacting elements that kind of play off of each other. So for example, you might have your attack and defense, both of which decide how much damage a character takes. And then you have your magic attack, magic defense, which does the same but for magic. You might have other stats like speed, which decide who moves first. This all plays into a combat system. Now the reason why I'm defining a combat system here is because, well, if it doesn't have one, then that's kind of more so something else. And the reason I'm going to also, one thing I'm also going to explicitly say here, it does not need to be combat in terms of fighting. When I say battle system, this can include something like, for example, in some of the old Mario Sports RPGs, playing tennis, where you're very much still have a battle system, even though it's not your usual defined battle system of combat. It's still a system where your stats are being plugged in, and that helps determine it. Now granted, skill is also a factor usually, and that actually comes into part number four, a preparation stage. Now this is something that I don't really hear a lot of people talking about, but I think is kind of core to the RPG experience. This is a period between battles where users can prepare or pretty much do anything necessary for upcoming battles. This will include things like towns where you can buy items, or a set of menus that you see in some strategy RPGs where you can upgrade your units. The reason I'm saying preparation stage instead of overworld is because there are some games where it is more so a menu system, and overworld might be kind of a generous way to say it. But preparation stage feels like it's a catch-all term for it. The final one is campaigns. Now the reason I don't say a story here or a definitive end point is because of MMORPGs. What is a campaign? It's a series of well-defined events with an end goal, be it plot related or otherwise. Sometimes this is directly what it sounds like, you go to defeat the Dark Lord and that's the plot, and other times it's completely different as in, hey, we just need to get this item and help this village and that's our end goal. Now, I feel like touching on these key aspects is kind of going to be essential, because there are a few games that I will not cover that might fall into all these, because RPGs are just an absolutely massive genre. I already played around 150 games just for this video. And on top of that, oh, hey, Blossom. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In case you haven't seen her yet, that's my cat Blossom. She's a little sweetheart. Um, but um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Um, she she distracts me very easily. But um, with this genre, it's kind of gonna let us narrow down what we cover. So, for example, let's take something that's kind of on the edge. Madden. A lot of people ask if these sports games can count as RPGs, and I would argue that the campaign mode can, if you just count that as its own mode. Granted, not all campaign modes, but a few can. There are a few where your statistical growth does not directly affect your character, it just lets you buy new cosmetics, and for those, I would argue, kind of no. You have things like build, uh, leveling, and stat growth. In some games, like for example, if you have a preparation stage where you're grinding in drills with teammates or practicing, then yeah, I would argue that kind of works under that. Now, I think we've covered about all we can without getting into the history of RPGs. You see, unlike other genres, Looking at the history of the genre very much helps you define what it is. And to do that, I think we should get into the full-on history. Now, I want to go ahead and clarify something. This is only part one of what's probably going to be a three or four part video series, so don't expect me to go too in-depth in this video. 
Part one, which is this part, is going to cover what we just covered right now, kind of the basics of the RPG, and early RPGs. So pretty much everything that's in this video is going to be up through the Super Nintendo. Not because there's nothing of note after that, but because the 3D era kind of was big for RPGs, and I felt that the Super Nintendo was a good point to cut it off at. Also, if there's an RPG that you love that I did not cover within this series, just comment down below. I might get around to it at some point, but honestly, it just shows how big the genre is that I can't really touch everything. With some of the other genres that I've looked at, I've had to scrounge and scrounge for stuff to talk about. But with RPGs, it's the other way around, where I have to either give something only five minutes that I would like to give a full 30, or found something where it's like, I need to talk about this, but I need to squeeze it in subtly. So, without further ado, let's get into that section. If you ask most people what the first RPG ever created is, whether it be pen and paper or digital, it's going to be Dungeons and Dragons, and for good reason. While it might not have been the first, it's often regarded as the predecessor to most modern RPGs. Now, what Dungeons & Dragons was, was at first a homebrew modification of a war game. Yeah, for those of you who have no idea what I just said, board games actually had fan-made additions. I am being completely serious here. You know how you might have had those home rules of Monopoly? Yeah, these people took it a little overboard. It was a modification for a war game, which, what are war games? It's an adaptation of something that we all know, chess. Chess is the most prominent war game of all time. Basically, you have set units, all of which you move across a field, but that's not important. Let's get back to Dungeons & Dragons. It's with that statement that we can determine why the term role-playing game came up. Rather than playing as the general who's moving all these units around, you're playing as one specific character. You're playing a role rather than playing general. Granted, you also have the person who is sitting behind the entire campaign, your dungeon master, or as many people will say, DM for short, who is essentially the general of this campaign, controlling what's happening and determining how dice rolls will turn. Now, Dungeons & Dragons, upon its release, became fairly popular, gaining kind of a cult following, which some people took a little too literally. Yeah, there were people who thought it was a literal cult. Have you ever heard of the term Satanic Panic? Because there is a lot of stuff around this, one of which was, I'm pretty sure, Tom Hanks' first appearance. I am not making this up, and the fact that I found this out means that I need to share it, because this is kind of hilarious. Like, we use the weird polygons to resurrect the Dark Lord kind of cult. It's, uh. While through my research I was unable to completely confirm what the first video game RPG is, there are a few early examples that I feel might hold the title and definitely should be mentioned. The earliest I could find was D&D. &D. Yeah, not Dungeons and Dragons, but the name is literally D-N-D. A direct adaptation of the tabletop RPG Dungeons and Dragons on the Play-Doh computer in 1975. Dungeons, another similar RPG on the Play-Doh system as well, released around the same time. And these two are both Beck's basic text-based RPGs. Yeah, nothing really to write home about. Um, fairly simple in concept and execution, but all factors considered, this is still fairly impressive for the time. The Play-Doh was actually designed as an educational computer, so I am honestly surprised that you can cram all of this onto something that only has two... <laughs> it's a monochrome screen. It only has the orange. Another game of note around this time is Rogue. This game is most well known nowadays as the origin of the roguelike genre, and it was the first prominent dungeon crawler. Simple mix of turn-based mechanics and generated dungeons, Rogue is definitely historically important and somewhat fun to revisit. But I think it's time we move on to what people want me to talk about, most likely, and that is home consoles. 
While the PC market was definitely a big part of RPGs, mainly because you have this thing. Yeah, I'm not joking. Text is a big part of RPGs, and you're going to see that a lot throughout this video retrospective. So it only makes sense that the device that you can use to type stuff up, you know, pay your taxes, send an email to someone, or uh, harass people on Twitter nowadays, was also the origin point for the RPG. Now, moving on to home consoles, RPGs were attempted on the Atari 2600, at least the Spy Think Store Quest is supposed to be. I genuinely can't tell. It wasn't until the release of a certain company's home console that we really saw RPGs begin to come into their own. Look, if you have to deal with a Dark Lord infestation, you also might have to pull your copy of your shotgun that you use for every single game that has ever slighted you in your life. Okay, don't judge me. Anyway, while the RPG genre didn't really catch its footing on Atari, when we move into the NES era, yeah, there's quite a few good ones. The first of which we're going to be talking about today, I don't actually own physically. I kept looking for a copy while I was trying to make this video, and for some reason it just uh, decided that it would disappear. Enix's Dragon Warrior, or as it's actually better known, Dragon Quest. Yeah, in America they didn't think Dragon Quest would sell well as a title, so they called it Dragon Warrior for multiple entries until eventually switching to Quest later. Look, you're gonna hear a lot of weird stuff about stage release releases in this series, so just get used to it. I'm gonna be honest. This game is actually pretty stunning for the Nintendo Entertainment System. While it shows its age, it's also colorful, surprisingly easy to follow, and just kind of fun. This game directly adapts the traditional Dungeons & Dragons battle dynamic via a turn-based system. Aspects of D&D that are usually solved via the DM or dice roll are instead solved via random number generation and just the game itself. Turn-based systems kind of became the norm for most RPGs in this era. For example, let's talk about what's probably the, si the biggest RPG series of all time, which actually got its start here, Final Fantasy. This series actually began as a last-ditch effort to save the company, and now it has 16 numbered entries, countless spin-offs, sequels to mainline entries, remakes, so yeah, I think it might have worked. Final Fantasy introduced a side-view battle system, a more serious tone, and more importantly, the party system. While Dragon Quest did have a single character, to my recollection in my time playing and looking through the manual, it only had one character. And, well, the party system is a response to the cooperative aspect of Dungeons & Dragons. You see, usually when you're playing Dungeons & Dragons, you have maybe four or five people in a campaign. I've seen as much as six, seven, or eight. And that's kind of the core of it, that social aspect. And bringing that into games through the party system was kind of the easiest adaptation. And, well, it also allows the player to command and control the stats of multiple units, so it inherently adds more complexity. This became the cornerstone of many RPGs which released after. Now, before we get into ones that are kind of going to go a little farther forward, let's talk about a few that I think are kind of notable, but aren't really going to get a whole lot of attention. Zelda 2 is another release of note, taking the RPG leveling and encounter mechanics and mixing them with a 2D action game like Castlevania. It's not that good, honestly. I know some people love this game, but I I just can't get into it. Moving on, one that I actually don't own physically is SNK's Tale of is SNK's Chrysalis. This game actually has a surprising amount of quality to it, and it's developed by SNK, so I kind of have to love it. I love SNK's output, for those of you who don't know what that company is. It's the one who's shoving all their stuff on the Nintendo eShop, or as I like to know them, the people who've made Last Blade, Samurai Showdown, King of Fighters, Metal Slug's one that almost everyone knows. And the final one is Hydelight. This is a mediocre adaptation of a 
PC RPG. And these are actually all the ones I own physically. I mean, I think Star Tropics kind of falls under that too. But in the United States, and actually let me clarify one thing, Star Tropics is a good game. I just don't think it is as a it qualifies fully on as an RPG as much as the other ones that we just talked about. Anyway, despite the US having a few notable releases, in Japan you really couldn't stop these things from releasing. Let's start with the probably the biggest genre definer that I have here. Digital Devil Stories. Right here I'm holding Digital Devil Stories 2, which is a sequel to the first game, obviously. Now, this series itself actually is not as important as you might think, but what it spawned was the Shin Megami Tensei series. And Shin Megami Tensei, Tensei eventually had a spin-off franchise, which... We will get to you when we get to you. I swear. <sighs> There's also Mother, which is the origin of the Earthbound series. The Ultima series, which is just kind of there. I mean, from what I've played, I enjoy, but I'm not going to go out of my way and say it's absolutely amazing. Sweet Home and multiple entries in both the Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy series only released in Japan. Fire Emblem also had its first entry in this generation, taking the party system and combining it with aspects of war games to form the strategy RPG. Due to a mix of factors including this censorship that Nintendo of America had over games at the time, English text taking up more cartridge space, and just a general lack of faith in performance, many RPGs never saw release in the States during this generation. Outside of Nintendo's console, there actually are a few of note. Sega's Master System saw the Fantasy Star, Golden Axe Warriors, which is actually later adapted into just Golden Axe, a beat em up, and Spellcasters, all of which are solid RPGs in their own right. The NES, despite having a solid selection of RPGs, was not the most optimized for the genre. If you look at things like the cartridge size limitation, or even the controller, which didn't have the optimal amount of buttons for what a lot of RPG fans were looking for, it was clear that consoles really were trying to catch up to where the PC market was with RPGs at the time. However, the next generation, RPGs really began to spread their wings. So, um... Apparently, Dark Lord infestations involve the, uh... Minions of the Dark Lord banging from the inside of your walls and screaming that they're in there. I was not made aware of this. I've called someone to deal with the problem. Look, my magical sword's broken, and all I have is this lousy shotgun. Like, what do you expect me to do? Make the impromptu reboot of Hole in the Wall? Yeah, we're not doing that. Let's just hope they arrive at a reasonable time. That might... Do I even have a doorbell? It take long battle of 15 minutes, but I think I clutched demon. I sent paycheck in mail. Can you leave then? No, you get out of house. This is my house, you idiot. You know what? I don't like attitude. Who is man holding weapon? It is not you, you dumb dumb. I will smash you. I will smash you with my wrench. Come here, you stupid. Uh, this is the last time. I use the first number in the phone book when calling for an exorcism. I think I look fine. Anyway, after the first big generation for RPGs, the NES and the Sega Master System, the new generation hit. This generation was home to quite a few consoles actually, but the main two that everyone refers back to are the Super Nintendo, 
and the Sega Genesis, or as it's known outside of the States, the Sega Mega Drive. The SNES was home to many RPGs, however before we talk about those, let's talk about the Genesis. On the Genesis, games like Fantasy Star received multiple entries, cementing itself as one of Sega's premier franchises at the time. Beyond Oasis was an early top-down action RPG, taking cues from Zelda 1 and mixing them with, with traditional RPG aspects. Shining Force 1 and 2 were tactical RPGs which borrowed heavily from Fire Emblem. Needless to say, the Sega Genesis had a decent library of RPGs. And, well, while there were a few that released only in Japan, I really don't feel like I need to talk too much about this. <laughs> like... The Sega Genesis has some good ones, but there's not really anything big enough to get into in depth right now. There was also PCs, which had a few interesting games. Elder Scrolls, a game by up-and-coming developer Bethesda, was released. Betrayal of Krondor exists. Oh, this one's actually kind of cool. Princess Maker released on the Japanese-only PC-98, a console which... I really want to talk about it at some point. I absolutely love the PC-98. Princess Maker was actually produced by Gynax. Yeah, that Gynax. The Evangelion people made an RPG. Fun fact, this actually got a spin-off on DS later, which um, had you raising Rei Ayanami and Asuka, but only released in Japan. There's full motion videos for the intro, and I just think that's neat. Okay, fine, enough stalling. I love the SNES RPG lineup. So, let's get into it. Square's RPG output on the SNES was... <sighs> amazing. And considered by many to be some of the best games they've ever released. I love a lot of these, so I'm going to shotgun through a few notable ones before we get into some of my favorites. Final Fantasy received multiple SNES entries, all of which were phenomenal and great evolutions of the formula created in the NES games, more heavily focusing on story, and in a few cases even experimenting with the SNES hardware. Secret of Evermore was, ta was a game taking heavy cues from another series with Secret in the title, Foreshadowing is a literary device in which, and oddly enough, never released in Japan. This one only came to the States. But don't worry guys, if we're looking at Japan only, Live Alive took an anthology format and adapted it into an RPG. Romancing Saga, another turn-based RPG series, received a trilogy of games in Japan. But in my opinion, a few games this generation really stood out. The first being... Please note, for this one, I actually don't own the SNES cartridge. It's around $60, and I had a hard time actually finding one for this video um, within decent price range. So right here is the collection of Mana SNES collection. Now, what do I think about Secret of Mana? Oh boy, don't even get me started on this game. I love it, unless we're talking about the PS4 remake, in which case... What is it with my favorite games and getting remakes that just disappoint me? Anyway, Secret of Mana was actually a sequel to a Final Fantasy spin-off, Final Fantasy Adventure, that was created for the Nintendo Game Boy. And with that premise, you'd think the game would be awkward on home console, usually taking a concept that's made for a handheld and porting it over to a home console doesn't work the best. The truth, however, is that this game was perfect for home consoles. It takes the top-down action formula made prominent by Zelda and combines it with RPG leveling equipment and a party system, even allowing for multiplayer. While this game and its Japanese-only successor, Trials of Mana, which actually got a state's release on this cartridge, and that's part of why I'm holding it here, are by no means revolutionary. The gameplay is just really fun. Like, honestly, the Mana series is some of the most fun I've had with RPGs, mainly because, well, it doesn't take itself too seriously all the time. It really feels like 
tonal wise, at least from what I played, it almost harkens back to the older RPGs where Square focused less on making some dark and disturbing story and just made something fun. And before you accuse me of saying that all Final Fantasy stories are dark, I'm just saying that this game, in my experience, feels a lot more like your Dragon Quest story-wise than your Final Fantasy. And, well, if we're talking about this more, the sequel has some of the best sprite art and graphics you will ever see on the Super Nintendo. Like, my god, this is insane. <sighs> Let's talk about our next game, Chrono Trigger. Do I really need to elaborate? It's beautiful, it's got an amazing story, and the cast is assigned by the same guy who made Dragon Ball. What's not to love? This game is kinda in the opposite boat of Secret of Mana. Taking a top-down, turn-based RPG formula and nearly perfecting it, rather than feeling like something that is unique among Square's SNES output, Chrono Trigger feels like a perfection of some of the things that they introduced. And that's not to say that this game isn't original. Chrono Trigger definitely has some elements like its story and just general presentation that feel wholly Chrono Trigger. It also removes a few nuisances that you see in these old system and polishes up the graphics and systems to make the transition between world and battle feel seamless most of the time. For game release nearly 30 years ago, it holds up phenomenally, and honestly, there's a reason why whenever Square says they're going to remake one of their old games and ask which ones there's a demand for, Chrono Trigger almost always comes up in the conversation. Before we look outside of Square, one last game of note is Super Mario RPG. In many ways, this game was the swan song to the SNES. It was one of the last games released, and well, during the time of its release, Square was only a few months away from another big release. One which we're actually not going to get into in this video, and we'll talk about next one. You probably all know what I'm talking about. This game combined the colorful, accessible world of Mario with the RPG experience of Square to make a fun and quirky adventure with a surprising amount of quality and heart. One thing I will say about this game is that the battle system takes a lot from turn-based RPGs, obviously, but includes this mechanic where your button timing can affect your attack. And honestly, this makes it one of the easier RPGs to recommend for people who think that turn-based RPGs can be boring. Something as simple as adding a button press when you're prompted to do an attack really can make people feel more engaged. While Square obviously had a decent library, what about Enix, Mystic Arc, G.O.T. Senki, Star Ocean, all great games which never released in the States. But we did get Illusion of Gaia, Act Razor, Soul Blazer, Terran, Terranigma, and Evo in the States. Most of these are fairly great games, but what about Dragon Quest? The third game received a remake and 4 and 5 released for the console, again only in Japan. I know most of these received remakes or fan translations later, but honestly, not too much to talk about. Nintendo themselves actually had a few great offerings this generation. Fire Emblem received three games, and the states received zero of those three Fire Emblem games. This is going to be a trend this video. Illusion of Gaia was published by Nintendo in certain regions, actually, but let's be honest, I think you all know what game I'm about to talk about. Earthbound is perhaps one of the most unique and fun turn-based RPGs out there. The characters are unique, the game feels more grounded than other RPGs in a way, taking place more so in a contemporary world, and the art style is another aspect of note. With the cutesy, almost Saturday morning cartoon style replacing the usually anime or fantasy-inspired art of its peers. Needless to say, this game has a legacy and impact which is hard to ignore. Omori, Undertale, Eastward, 
Knuckle Sandwich, Contact, Off, Yume Nikki, Oddity, One Shot, and the Lisa games all have some of Earthbound's DNA within them. Well, the series might not have gone on to be as big and prominent as series like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest, you can't argue that it does have a legacy. The fact that this one game has maintained its relevance by inspiring others is kind of... fitting. It's fitting that a game that is this unique among the SNES's RPG lineup would have this unique of a legacy. And honestly, even though it didn't have many entries, I think it's no less important to cover it in this retrospective. Now moving from series which got no future entries, well, I mean, there was one on the GBA, but we never got that here, to Tales that just got a lot of them. Tales of Fantasia, the start of Bandai Namco's Tales series released this generation. Capcom's premier RPG series, Breath of Fire, also started around this time. In Japan, Shin Megami Tensei got its first titled entry. The first two games on Super Famicom were part of the Digital Devil Staga series and quickly established itself as a series capable of longevity. But the two games that were released on later consoles, yeah. Yeah, this is actually titled Shin Megami Tensei. It's no longer Digital Devil Stories. While the SNES had some absolutely amazing games, a revolution was coming. The dawn of CDs and entry of a particular company into the console market would break open the door for RPGs to explode. But I think that's a story best saved for next episode. Now... Usually this is the point where I would say, hey guys, it's Sharp Z signing off, but I feel we still have more that we could talk about with this. And, well, through thinking about it, I thought the best idea for this series would be to split up the design sections. So, for this episode, we're going to talk about some of the early design philosophies that emerged in early RPGs. Alright, let's get into the game design side of things. And I know what some of you are thinking. Why are you tacking this on to the end of this video? Well, for one thing, I want to make sure that each of these are fairly decently sized videos. And for another, I feel like this gives me the opportunity to kind of move out a little bit from whatever area of RPGs we're covering while still kind of leaning back on it. For this first episode, we're going to mostly be talking about build and a little bit about the concept of overworlds, or as I called it earlier, the preparation zone. You see, in early RPGs, build was a little different than it is now. See, build basically allows players to have choices. In early games, this can be seen with, well, basic equipment. For example, things like weapons, armor, all help you to decide how you're going to play. Do you want to make a character who heavily focuses on magic? Well, you might want to focus on having gear that makes your magic spells more powerful, or you want to really focus on finding items that will help you if your magic meter goes low. Compare this to an attack build where you might want to focus on things like armor that will make you quicker so you can hit quicker, or maybe getting a weapon with a higher attack bonus. Even in games with very, very restrictive class systems, for example, something like Final Fantasy or Sweet Home, you do have some control over it. For example, in Final Fantasy, the primary purpose of your main party is decided by you. Yeah. At the beginning of the game, you get to choose who your class members are. And most of them are actually heavily based off of D&D classes, so this wasn't stuff that would be unfamiliar at the time. If you want a class that focuses heavily on magic, 
get a few mages. If you want a more balanced class, kind of balance it out between mages, more physical attackers, and maybe put in one other class just to mix things up. If you want a very traditional class, grab one healer, one character who's a heavy damage dealer, one character who's a magic user, and one character who can really take a hit. This concept is something that you even see in single player games. The best example that I can think of off the top of my head is something like uh, the Elder Scrolls series. For example, in most of Bethesda's RPGs, I say Elder Scrolls because it's kind of the one that a lot of people like to point to, but you can also see it in games like Fallout. You select your stats before you begin the game. Now, while this is probably the most direct adaptation you can have of a D&D character sheet, that doesn't necessarily mean that your build is as restricted as it is in D&D. Usually you can still improve other stats, either by leveling or sometimes through other tasks in the world. For example, in something like Persona 5, you have things that you can do outside of battle to improve, ta to improve stats that help you to grow closer to people. Yeah, it's kind of a common thing to have a whole bunch of stats that the game tells you you can't focus on all of these, so just focus on the ones you think you're going to use. This has led to a strategy that is known within the RPG community as min-maxing. What min-maxing is, basically, is minimizing other stats so that others can be as optimized as possible. The best example I can think of of this, and no story spoilers incoming, I'm literally just talking about a character mechanic. Not even going to show gameplay here because I don't want to risk it. Go play the Xenoblade series. Dunban is a class that's known as an evasion tank, and one of the abilities that you can gain down his skill tree is the ability to, well, gain a whole lot of speed by wearing no armor. While this puts you at a major disadvantage on paper, because, well, you're not wearing any armor, so you're not going to be able to take as many hits, the speed you boost you get from it is enough that most of the time, Dunban's not going to get hit. Yeah. An evasion tank, for those of you who are unaware, is a class where you more so focus on your speed and evasion stats to avoid getting hit in the first place. Pretty much the inverse of a usual tank where you have the goal of getting hit and maybe one or two skills that nullify damage, but for the most part, you are characters focusing on... Yeah, not getting hit. You're focused on just tanking all the damage. And while min-maxing works in most games that have a more wide variety party system, for example in a lot of MMOs, which is, if I remember correctly, where this term kind of became more common, and you also see it sometimes in D&D, it's very common due to the fact that you have the massive player base. So if you want to make a cleric that solely focuses on healing and not really worry about attacking at all, you can do that because there's other players, usually who are incentivized to work with you, who will focus on attack. Same thing for something like tanks. If you want to focus on making your character a damage sponge who heals quicker than he can be killed, that might be the best option for you. But. You can also have a friend who's playing a high DPS class who doesn't need to focus on their defense or their healing because they have you to tank the hits while they go and do all the damage. Granted, it's a little more complex than that in some cases, but min-maxing is basically a response to party build. And honestly, you kind of see it in other aspects of game design. For example, skill trees will often funnel similar skills down one branch of the tree Mainly because, hey, if you like having high sword attack, you're likely going to like the skill that lets you have a higher crit rate. Or if you like a more stealthy build that focuses on not getting caught, you might like skills that are related to speed and evasion, but you might also like a skill where it allows you to, well, gain a crit by hitting an opponent when they're not noticing you. Things like this often optimize stuff for a certain build, and well, this kind of has led to, even in games where there are no classes, 
players kind of making their own. For example, if you were to look at something like Skyrim, even though to some extent there are classes, there are definitely some that have been made over time because players lean toward a specific build. Now, I'm saying all this to get back to the point that the build is perhaps the most important part of the RPG to most people. It defines what you can do, and for many, myself included, one of the most enjoyable parts of an RPG is being able to optimize that system with your build. For example, I often like to have one character who I focus very heavily on crits with and give a lot of gear to either maximize their chance for crits, maximize their attacks so those crits do a lot more damage, or maybe gear that has some special ability that gives them the ability to hit more crits within a certain amount of time or under certain circumstances. Furthermore, I usually like to focus on my healers having items that make sure that they don't get hit at all, items that make sure that they can heal effectively, and usually if anyone's going to be using a revival item, it's going to be my healer because, well, you need that magic for the healing most of the time. With all this being said, there is an inherent complexity to build the further and further we get down the timeline. Games like Dark Souls, for example, have builds that would not really be possible on something like the NES. So it kind of stands to reason that the further and further we get into this, the more important build becomes. Now, with build out of the way, let's talk about the preparation phase. The preparation phase, as I referred to it earlier, can be one of two things. Either just some kind of period of downtime, whether it be via menus or just relaxing, outside of the actual battle system, or if the battle system is just a core part of the game, a time that's just spent working on your build, maybe gathering resources, anything that's not part of that core battle system. A game that usually that thrives during this time, in my opinion, is Undertale, where you have a ridiculous amount of things to do for such a small indie game. Other games that kind of have this philosophy are Dark Souls, where I know I've mentioned it before, but hey, not the biggest fan, but it kind of exemplifies a lot of these tropes. If you look at Dark Souls, even though there is no direct split between the battle system and just your overworld, you still have the option to do things like set a bonfire and upgrade your skills, you can spend time looking at weapons, and if I remember correctly, there are specific areas that are more so lore-focused than combat-focused. Even in games when there is no dis where there is no distinct separation, the player can often still find some area of time to prepare. Heck, if we want to get even more technical, games like Skyrim have their own preparation areas. These are usually towns where, while yes, you can get into fights with guards, you're usually going to be spending your time preparing. Persona has perhaps the most direct division when you look at the system pretty much present throughout 3, 4, and 5, where you have your school life portion, which acts more like a dating sim, but does allow you to grab items and build relationships that will help when you enter back into the shadow world or palace or 25th hour. I probably just messed up what it's called in Persona 3. I have not played that game as review for this video. But that's perhaps the most direct form of it. Even if you don't have an overworld you're walking around in, in some games you just kind of have menus you can go through. In something like the Shin Megami Tensei series, for example, you have an overworld where you can run around, collect items that will help you in battle, or if you are an idiot like me, just spend time looking at this metro map and wondering, wondering where to go for about 30 to 40 minutes because you're not that good at navigating maps. Look, in my defense, this looks like something you would see in Life the Board Game. But with that being said, 
These two concepts are kind of core to early RPGs. Top-down worlds were the easiest way to set an RPG because, well, in a top-down sprite-based world, you can easily just plop in a few towns, plop in a few characters, and reuse a lot of assets over and over again. Now, granted, as we move on, obviously the camera angles change, but to an extent, this is kind of a core part of the RPG. If you're going on a long, sprawling adventure, which a lot of RPGs have as one of their core tenets, then it makes sense that there's a massive world for you to explore. Granted, strategy RPGs don't always follow this. For example, some of the games in the Fire Emblem series, games like Advance Wars, and if I remember correctly, a lot of the XCOM series don't have your traditional overworld, per se. Yeah, a lot of it's just spending time in menus. But it still counts, since it's a period of time where you're not actively engaged with the battle system. Granted, that's something that more so came later on, when games focused differently on this kind of thing. But I feel like, with everything being said, that about covers what I want to cover today. Hey guys, this is uh, Editing Room Sharp Z. So I realized, after I recorded this, I forgot to put my suggestion section in. Um, I usually would do that at the end of the entire retrospective, but since this is kind of a unique case, I thought I would do, it all, do them all at once here. Um, so we're going to start from the NES and kind of move forward. Honestly, if we want to talk about anything before then, I would say Rogue is the only one which really um, holds up enough for me to recommend it, mainly due to just how significant it is with the entire roguelike genre kind of becoming a big thing here in the last decade or so. But um, if we're talking the NES, Final Fantasy, and I don't own a physical copy, still couldn't find one, uh, Dragon Warrior or Dragon Quest are both solid. Uh, Sweet Home is also a very solid experience, as is Mother. I would say when it comes to NES, there's maybe three or four. Um, if you want to look at the Master System, Fantasy Star, and... I want to say Golden Axe Warrior were the two that I kind of enjoyed the most for that console. Uh, moving on to the Super Nintendo, before we go over into Japan fully, actually, I do one more for NES, the Digital Devil Saga series. I think there are fan translations of these out and about. Um, honestly, play it. It's a completely interesting experience when you compare it to what came after with Shin Megami Tensei and just Persona and everything started with those games. Let's move on to the um, SNES. Granted for these I actually just own the PS1 remakes for some reason so um, I'm just gonna put my put the remakes up on the screen to show what I'm talking about. Um, so this right here is Final Fantasy Chronicles, a collection of Final Fantasy IV and Chrono Trigger. This one came out on the PlayStation 1. And I want to say with uh, this one in particular, it's one of those games where you can go back and you kind of look on it and you say, yeah, Chrono Trigger, it very much is emblematic of what RPGs were then. It's kind of taking that formula and perfecting it. Um, and while it's not my favorite out of those RPGs on the SNES we talked about, it's definitely one of the ones where I can definitely see why it has such a solid fan base even to this day. Uh, speaking of games which released recently here in the States, we have Live Alive. The remake is amazing. Uh, the fact that Square is using their Octopath Traveler engine for projects that are not Octopath Traveler is very enticing to me. I would love to see them revisit the uh, Mana series, obviously, which, speaking of, if you want to play the Mana series, this is the way I would recommend. Collection of Mana has the uh, two Super Nintendo entries, Secret of Mana and Trials of Mana, finally released with um, English translation. And... There's also a remake of Trials that's floating around, and I've heard it's decent. I haven't played it myself, didn't really get around to doing that for this video, but this is a solid pickup. Usually you can get it for cheaper than that remake, 
comes with Secret, Trials, and Final Fantasy Adventure, which is the first Game Boy entry that it was a spinoff of. Um, also, most of the Final Fantasy games are readily available now. For the games that I said didn't release in the States, a lot of them you see come over later. Granted, there's a few, like, I'm, I want to say Digital Devil Stories 1 and 2 are under some kind of copyright issue, mainly because it was an adaptation of a book. Um, and the first few Shin Megami Tensei games, to my knowledge, I don't know if SMT 1 and 2 have been fully localized. I know that you can actually play the Japanese versions on the Nintendo Switch Online service, but I don't know if they've ever been localized. There's definitely fan translations floating around out there. Um, for a few that I did not really go in depth into, um, Sweet Home is one of those games where I'm probably going to keep recommending it for as long as I can. For Halloween this year, I've already kind of pre-decided that's going to be the game that we're going to, one of the games we're going to go over. Uh, October's not going to be focused really on a genre, it's just going to be picking a few horror games, doing kind of some reviews on them. But, um... For the recommendations, I really don't think I have too much more that I want to get into. If we're talking PC, actually, um, there are a few interesting PC games that came out around this era. The Princess Maker series is actually one of those, if you look into it and it seems like the kind of thing you're into, go for it. Evo, that's another one I fell in love with. I want to say... Um, forget who it was, but someone made a video on it like a while back. But the core of this game is the evolution mechanic. And honestly, if you compare it to something like Spore, it feels a whole lot different, but there's kind of this charm to it that you don't really see that often in these old RPGs. Of It is a very novel concept. And honestly, that's what I really like about it. It might not be the best game execution-wise. It kind of drops the ball on the gameplay, but the concept and just some of the writing's pretty funny too. Evo's just one of those games you need to experience if it interests you. Um, I would just say overall what kind of solidified this generation of RPGs is it was kind of codifying what you see later. Um, for example, if you look at something like Final Fantasy making the party system, you see later games, like Sweet Home, for example, took the party system and splits your characters up to give you a feeling of fear. Or you have later games, even beyond that, like you look at something like um, Xenoblade as a series, focuses very heavily in most games on the interactions between your party members. And as a result, that also is key to your gameplay usually, because you're not um, building your entire party around one character, you're building all your characters to interact with each other. So it's just things like that where um, RPGs, you can very much see why early on they were the optimal format for putting a narr uh, more, I guess, complex narrative into a game. Uh, it didn't require as much um, legroom to adapt that mechanic to fit with the story. So with all that being said, I'm going to hand it back to pre-editing Sharp Z and let him briefly wrap this up and then after the credits I have a few things I do want to talk about so yeah but there's definitely more to talk about here we haven't even hit the 3D era and well join me next time for us to talk about the entry of 3D and how one stupid yellow rat took over the world. All that and more, next time on Genre in a Bottle. Alright, that was, um... Part one. Part two, as I briefly teased at the end of this, is mostly going to go over the early 3D era, so PS1, N64, and a little bit on the Saturn, actually. 
um, as well as a, covering a few PC games around the time. Um, on top of that, we're also going to be talking about handhelds, at least very briefly. You kind of need to talk about the, I feel, the Game Boy and the uh, GBA, especially since we're also going to be talking about the N64 and the GameCube, and there are a few games which kind of had cross-compatibility between the two. Um, we also, by extension of talking about the GameCube, it's going to be the PS2 and the Dreamcast. I think there's one game I found on original Xbox that I kind of decided not to go too in-depth on, but um, looking at what we have for the rest of the series lined up, it's honestly shaping up pretty well. Um, next video, we will actually have a guest appearance from someone, so look forward to that. Um, also, just going to do some kind of basic um, housekeeping kind of thing here. So we have a few other videos in the works. There is going to be a video specifically on Pokemon. I played quite a few of those games for the sake of this video. Xenoblade Chronicles is getting its own massive video as well, um, all three of them. I'm just waiting for the final DLC wave for 3 to come out, and then I'm, I kind of want to talk about the series as a whole because it's one of my favorite series for one, th for one and also because I just... I just really want an excuse to gush about Xenoblade for like two hours. So <laughs> there's going to be that. Um, also, there I might be starting a podcast here in the next maybe two or three weeks. I want to start talking about game design in kind of a more generalized sense. I'm still going to keep doing things like genre in a bottle, um, Sharp Z reviews, and maybe going to add one or two more shows. There's also going to be a bad RPGs video after this retrospective wraps up because trust me, just like with horror games, when you play a certain amount, you end up finding a few games that are absolutely abysmal um, and <laughs> you kind of want to share those, so I'm going to throw them in there. Uh, but with how things are right now, we're looking at a three-part series. Um, I would say next video that's covering pretty much everything for the first two generations of 3D consoles. After that, we're going to make a video that covers the DS. Um, going to briefly talk about maybe one or two games on the Wii. Um, obviously, Xbox 360, PS3. Um, the PS4, Xbox One, and Wii U slash Nintendo Switch have some games, but there's... A lot of those games are newer, and since RPGs are so story-heavy, I really don't feel comfortable spoiling anything, so I'm not going to go too in-depth on those generations. But we're also going to have a brief aside talking about indie games. That was something that I did for um, the horror video, and I kind of want to bring it back. I want to make it a standard thing, because I, I just love indie games. Um, and I feel like they're a part of the genre that usually gets overlooked. So it's going to be an opportunity to look over a few that are either coming out soon and look really good, a few that I've already played, or um, a few that just kind of feel interesting enough to get their own section. Also, if you are not into RPGs and are just waiting for the next one, to, uh, next genre in a bottle episode, I have a few ideas that I'm tossing around, but... Um, in general, what I want to do with this series, first part of every year, we're going to have this longer three-part format. Uh, near the end, you're going to begin to, see, like, near uh, the middle of the year is when you're going to begin to see it go back to the shorter forms, so I kind of want to do um, a few on genres. Like, investigation games was something that I had the idea of since I wanted to make um, <laughs> this series. Um but the other ones that are kind of in the running, um, collectathons are in there. Um, simulation games fall under the same kind of umbrella. The key issue that you run into with some of these genres is for some of them, it's very hard to pinpoint a start. Uh, with RPGs, despite how broad the genre is, it's fairly easy to just go from Dungeons and Dragons because it's literally one of the first... Um, <laughs> video game adaptations of just anything um, and 
it's so core to what the genre is that e even though I think there are one or two examples of some kind of tabletop role-playing game before, um, there's not really enough for me to, you know, research too much further into the history of tabletop. Because almost everywhere you look, they just say, there might have been one or two before, but Dungeons and Dragons, just go for that one. Um... But yeah, I, uh, the ones that I am thinking of, collectathons would be fun to do. I really like that genre, and I feel like it would be kind of a nice break from RPGs where a lot of your time spent in menus to go do something where it's just go collect a certain amount of items, have fun with platforming. Um, for I, I've also considered action games, and there's one uh, uh, sub-series I'm going to start based on. I mentioned I played a lot of Pokemon for this. I want to make a sub-series where it's me talking about genres that I think should somehow exist, because here's the thing, um, genre by its nature is something that's designed to categorize things to make it easier for people to find them, and while there are some genres that I very much can understand why they're so broad, like RPGs as a concept is very broad, and then you have smaller separations like JRPGs or RPGs made in Japan. Um, WRPGs are RPGs made in the West. Beyond that, you have strategy RPGs, turn-based RPGs, action RPGs, um, cards. There are some RPGs that are card games. Like, there is so much variety within this genre when it comes to subgenre, and there is one that I kind of have been seeing as a little bit of a trend throughout some of these games that I kind of want to make a video on. I'm still thinking of a name for that. But um, we're going to keep making videos more consistently now. It's just that this first half of the year, I spent a lot of time doing research for this series and uh, kept doing edits and rewrites mostly because this is the big one for me. This is the one I wanted to do since the series started, mainly because RPGs are probably my favorite genre. And it's weird to go from making one hour long video to a three part, three hour video series. Um, but yeah, um, until next time, guys, this is officially Sharp Z signing off. I've talked for an extra seven minutes with no video in the background. So if you are still watching at this very end moment, uh, you're probably already subscribed. But if not, there is a big red button there. And I know everyone tells you not to press the big red button. But, you know, if you do it, um, you will subscribe to this channel. Uh, due to what my lawyer has told me, I cannot say that anything else will happen. So until next time, guys, Sharp Z signing off.